thanks and Justin, thank you so much. We'll start off the webinar right now. Uh, we'll start by giving a three minute presentation of Cluster. And then after that, I'll hand it over to Nicole who will lead the webinar and uh, ask you guys questions. So right now I'll share my screen. Uh, all right, let me, let me figure that out. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Well, um, thank you everyone, um, all attendees and uh, panelists uh, for coming to our webinar. Uh, my name is Thorzen, uh, co-founder of Cluster, and I just wanted to talk to you briefly about what Cluster is. So Cluster is an on-demand platform for any high school student to get one-on-one -on -one coaching with current college students. And uh, two of our coaches from our platform are joining us today, Justin and Anson. Well, actually three of it, three of them, and Nicole as well. So if you want to get coached by any of these amazing, superbly smart uh, college students, you know, please visit www.cluster.com. Uh, just to give briefly tell you about, you know, who's Cluster, who's the face behind Cluster. As I've mentioned, my name is Dawson and my co-founder and best friend since high school, Rajish. Uh, we went to high school together and Rajish went off to U Chicago. I went to Brown and uh, we've been friends ever since. And after we graduated, or sometime after we graduated, uh, we decided that this will be a good idea to help other high school students go through the daunting application process. So please visit Cluster. The booking a coach uh, process is very easy. All you gotta do is search. You can search by school, by the major that the coaches are studying and by what the coach can help you with. And uh, once you fill out a very brief booking form, you can happily talk to them. Uh, so follow us on social media, email us at hello at cluster.com. And with that, I'd like to introduce our webinar lead for today, who is Nicole also one of our coaches. Uh, Nicole studied at BU, sociology at BU, and just graduated this May. And she's on to her master's at Northwestern University studying uh, marketing and communications. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Like <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Nicole, I'll hand it over to you and uh, you can share your screen. Uh, so should I share my screen now? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you guys um, for, all right. Cool. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. So we have Anson and Justin here um, who both go to Johns Hopkins to talk about their experiences as well as, um, you know, what it's like writing college essays and the whole application process. If you guys just want to um, quickly introduce yourselves and then we can jump in. Yeah, um, I can go first. So hi, everyone. My name is Anson. I'm currently a sophomore studying biomedical engineering at Hopkins. And my focus is on cell and tissue engineering. So how we can use the body's existing tissues and use like materials or uh, molecules to actually train them into doing different functions that we want. And for my research, I focus on regenerative medicine. Um, and I also do a couple other things at Hopkins, including education outreach. Uh, I work at the admissions office and do work with their access and diversity committee. And I also work with some entrepreneurship and startup um, endeavors as well. So, hi, my name is Justin. Um, I am Anson's twin brother, fun fact. Uh, also go to Hopkins, study BME. Uh, my concentration is on imaging and medical devices. Um, so looking at how we can identify different clinical problems in hospitals right now and try to find some sort of medical device solution to it. And then I specialize more on the business development side. So I'm actually part of the Alpha Kappa Psi business fraternity right now. And um, that's really helped me understand, you know, what market analysis is like, the entrepreneurship sphere, and looking at how we can build a business development model for uh, different medical innovations. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Um, let's just jump right in. Wait. Um, so let's just talk kind of about the common essay and common app in general. Um, if you guys have any insights that you would want to share from what it was like when you went through the process, um, I'm sure everyone would be happy to hear it. Sure. Whoever wants um, to start. First. Yeah, I can go first. So 
I guess I'll just reflect a little bit on, on my experience first with, with the Common App essay. Um, so as you guys probably know, the in general, if you're applying, I guess like early decision or early action anywhere, usually the deadlines around November. And then if you're applying for the regular decision, usually end of December, early January. Uh, and I want to get a little bit of a head start, especially with, with the Common App essay. So I started around late August and was working on it through September and then editing through October and then up until um, you know, the, the deadline started coming up. And um, that's one thing I would recommend, first of all, is to start early so that you can have plenty of time to grow over many iterations or even have, I guess, new insights as you go through the semester. Because even in just a matter of a couple of months, you can have um, a lot of new, uh, I don't want to go as far as say like epiphanies, but you might have new like ways of viewing how you want to present yourself. You might learn new things about yourself. You might have new things that you want to tell the admissions committees. Um, and that's pretty hard to put onto paper and start writing from scratch every single time you come up with like a new idea. It's good to have foundation and tweak it and change the story just a little bit every single time. So I would highly recommend, first of all, starting early in the summer if you can, or at least jotting down an outline. Um, in terms of what to talk about, I'm pretty sure that the prompt I use was actually the prompt where you can write about anything you want. And I, I personally like that a lot because you have so much freedom and I was using the other prompts that were provided to sort of guide what I want to write, but not restricting myself to those exact prompts. Because it's pretty important if you do choose one of those prompts that you actually answer them directly. Um, for, for my essay, I talked about my curiosity because I knew that was a big part of um, my identity and also what I wanted to pursue at Hopkins was, was research, which is one of its biggest things. And obviously curiosity is a huge component of that. And I essentially pulled from different experiences of my life and um, used those to show how I was a curious individual. Um, and in a, like a very broad way, I think it's important to pull from very specific experiences that you've had in order to show an admissions officer a certain trait or a certain uh, lesson that you've learned rather than simply telling them. Yeah. Yeah, so I can go. Um, so my comment app essay was pretty much a similar timeline. I think I started thinking about what I was gonna write about like mid to end of my junior year. Um, I know that gets around like a really busy time for people taking AP and IB tests and especially you're taking like SAT subject tests, um, worrying about you know, actually starting to come in up and like building that up. Um, that's just like a time where I started ideating and like brainstorming ideas I could write. And, you know, throughout the entire summer uh, leading up to senior year, I was continually jotting down my notes, like different potential ideas I could write about. Um, I think in the end, like by November, I want to say, I came up with like seven, like very different essays. And I was kind of picking like, which one do I want to improve on and like actually submit? Um, I was interested in applying early to a few schools actually. So I had some schools that were due October 15th, which is uh, much earlier than a regular decision applicant would submit their essay. Um, but my advice would basically be um, definitely start early. Um, so I would say um, by senior summer, you should really start thinking about it, like even before Common App opens. Um, a lot of uh, Common App essay and like personal narrative coaches will tell you to not use a template um, because that just sounds like that's something admissions officers look for when when they read something like um, are they just following a template is it boring or is it actually going to stimulate my interest to continue learning more about this applicant um, and I would also say just like don't be like very convoluting and like try to put like so many ideas into your story because it has to be succinct you only have like 650 words so it has to be enough that you're talking about yourself instead of you know, other people or other ideas. And at the same time, um, like really demonstrating what you are and how intricate and complex you can be and what you can bring to the university. Um, so yeah, my, my focus more on the community service aspect. I did throw in uh, my summer research opportunities in there, but I was trying to merge my um, international experiences because I had lived in uh, China a few years before coming to America. Um, and then I want to bring in like my kind of diverse perspective and combine it with my interests in medicine and how diverse that was. Um, so I thought it was a pretty cool uh, opportunity and uh, you're gonna go through like different, um, many different iterations, but in the end, just pick the one that you feel like
best represents you and um, definitely get feedback from other people to see what they think of it as well. Thank you guys both for um, sharing all those insights. I, yeah, I mean, even though I'm five years out of the process now, I kind of just want to echo everything that both of them said. Um, I think one of the most important aspects of the Common App essay is, you know, it's the one big opportunity you have to kind of show who you are to the admissions counselors and whoever is reading it. Um, and so one of the biggest things that I was told that I kind of tried to embody in my essay and that I've, you know, heard time and time again is showing some level of growth as well. And whether it's an event that happened or um, several different experiences and like tying them all together through one, you know, big central theme um, is definitely one way to go about it too. Not the right, there's, you know, really no wrong way to do this. Um, there's not a specific right way either, um, but it's kind of finding the, it's finding the way to kind of show who you are um, and tell, uh, talk about yourself in a way that um, you've kind of shown some level of growth. Uh, so moving forward, moving on, we're going to talk about um, the Johns Hopkins supplemental essay. So if you guys wouldn't mind sharing something you'd like um, the admissions committee to know about you, whether it's your interest, your background, your identity, or your community, and how it uh, shaped what you want to get out of your college experience at Hopkins. So how did you guys um, respond to this um, supplemental essay and how, what kind of advice do you have for people in the future, for students in the future? Yeah. Um, well, I guess first off, I kind of want to answer, I think there's a question in the Q&A box. Um, sh should I answer that? I guess I can answer that really quickly. Um, and it's asking how common is it for biomedical engineering students at Hopkins to go on to medical school? Um, and this is something they talk about a lot. If you go to a BME info session at Hopkins, that's a question that's always asked. And the very anecdotally, but this is something they always say is about one third go into industry. So whether you go to become an engineer at, you know, a med tech company or, or go into consulting. So that's about a third, about a third go into graduate school, uh, generally PhD in bioengineering, electrical engineering, some sort of engineering um, in academia. And then the third, last third go on to medical school. And the acceptance rate for Hopkins overall medical school is about 80%. Um, and then for biomedical engineering program, it's about 94%. So it is a decent bit higher. And I think that rate is actually higher than any institution in the United States, which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, you are studying engineering for as a pre-med, which is a lot for, for to like combine that together. But I hope that answers that question. Um, and then with regards to the supplement, this is actually a pretty interesting question because for many, many years until this year, the Johns Hopkins supplement was actually a different question. The question for many years was, um, how would you uh, talk about a time that you collaborated and then talk about how like that demonstrates your ability to collaborate at Hopkins? Because that was something that they really tried to emphasize is that collaborative atmosphere. Um, and I think that's something in this supplement can also encompass, but clearly they give you so much more room um, to talk about your interests, your background, and your identity. So I can't talk about what I wrote for this supplement because I never answered this supplement. But I have definitely answered supplements like this at other universities. And I've also read a bunch of essays from this year, people applying to class of 2025 um, with that supplement. And what I personally like to see is when someone takes um, an identity that they have. So we'll say, let's say we'll use a curiosity um, identity again that I use. Say like curiosity is something you mentioned either in your common app essay or it's something that you allude to in your activities or in maybe another shorter essay that you submitted. Um, it's something that's like relatively clear but not elaborated on. Um, I like to see people take this and elaborate on it and use another anecdote to explain how they demonstrate that specific identity. So if it's something that you haven't covered in your common app essay, or it could be a totally new identity altogether, I think this is a great way to show um, multi-dimensionality of yourself. And then to follow that, I think it's really important to tie that into that last part is how it shapes you and how that ties into your college experience at Hopkins. And much too often, I see that last part as only like one or two sentences at the end of the supplement, which is a pretty big mistake, I think, because Yes, it's great to learn about um, who you are in the eyes of the admissions officer, but more importantly is how that specific identity or 
or you in general is going to take that and contribute something to the Hopkins community. Um, because it should be you know, a two-way street where you're helping a university, but the university is also helping you. And um, in, for people who are pursuing to research, I know very frequently they kind of go online and do a very surface level search and find a professor that they're interested in. And they're like, oh, um, this professor does research on like cancer and I, cancer is such a horrible disease. So I would like to do that. That doesn't tell anyone because obviously everyone thinks that cancer is a horrible disease. Everyone wants to do research on cancer. There are probably 250 different professors that do cancer research at Hopkins. So it's really important um, to think hard and say, if you find a specific opportunity at Hopkins that you want to pursue and you talk about that in your essay, how does that directly tie to you? And it has to be something that's almost indisputable. So you can't just like plug in another character trait or plug in another lab or plug in another club or plug in another internship opportunity at Hopkins. Um, it has to be something that only fits because those two match. And I think that's a, a good broad guideline to go by when you're answering supplements like this. Yeah. Yeah, definitely echoing everything Anson said. Um, like him, I, I answered the collaboration supplement, uh, not this new one. Um, but I, I do think that both of the supplements are pretty similar to each other. Um, Hopkins still emphasizes that very collaborative atmosphere. So if that's something you want to talk about um, when you're uh, discussing what you want to contribute to your Hopkins experience, that could definitely be an avenue to explore. Um, like, like Anton said, you don't want to um, write a very generic supplement where it could apply to multiple universities. Um, it's important to show that you are you have really done um, heavy research on Hopkins specifically. Um, so whether or not um, that's like talking about the city of Baltimore and uh, how diverse it is and what you're excited to explore in Baltimore specific regions and neighborhoods. Um, maybe something about how Hopkins has uh, top-notch programs and you know BME, public health, um, we're top three hospital um, in the nation. Uh, something talking about that. So that is obviously something unique to Hopkins and not every single university is gonna have that. Or maybe you could even go uh, talk about campus if you visited Hopkins campus before and talk about um, what your experiences were like. Um, did you talk to anyone or do you know anyone from Hopkins and what they told you about the college experience? So it's really about showing that curiosity and that you are willing to make an impact to Hopkins, but you also have to understand that JHU is that very academic university and they look for highly motivated people. Um, so you have to do your research and just be succinct with your answer. Awesome, thank you guys both for your very detailed answers. I think you gave really good insight. Um, I did want, there were a couple of questions that were emailed uh, to us that I wanted to bring up. Um, and one of them is what kinds of extracurricular activities are best for getting into JHU? Um, and the other one is, is class rank considered? Um, sure, I can go, I can go first. So I'll answer the second question first. Um, class rank considered, I don't think it's something that's heavily weighted. Um, but I will say this is like publicly available information, something like 98 or 99% of admitted Hopkins students are, are in the top 10% of the class. So that's something you can find on the Hopkins website. So it's something that they, they consider, but I definitely don't think it's something that's uh, of something of very heavy consideration. Um, the extracurricular activities that, that's asked in the first question is probably something that's, I would say, um, in addition to the essays, are probably the largest consideration for, for Hopkins admissions. So this is a question that's difficult to answer. And I'm sure if you ask this to any current student, any admissions officers, they're not going to give you a direct answer because there is no direct answer. Um, it varies so widely from uh, what you want to pursue. And sometimes it's not even related at all. So I can, I think the best way I can give examples, uh, best way I can help answer this question is by giving a couple examples of students or my friends that I know and what kind of things they did and, and what they eventually started pursuing at Hopkins. So I guess I can talk about myself first. So um, I made it really clear in my essays, both my supplement and my common app essay and in my extracurriculars that I wanna go to Hopkins to pursue research. Research is like in the foundation of Johns Hopkins, right? Because they're the number one, they're the number one receivers of funding from the NIH. And they're also the number one receivers of funding overall. They have like a billion dollars more in federal research funds than any other uh, educational institution in the US. They are also 
um, high emphasis on undergrad research where they have like 85 to 90 percent of undergrads pursue research at some point um, and that's what I want to take advantage of so um, the type of extracurricular activities I did obviously involved doing some research so in high school I spent a couple of sum a couple of summers doing research at my local university and that was something I talked heavily about um, in my essays and then obviously talked about it in my activity section I got a letter of recommendation from from my uh, professor and I also submitted an abstract that from the research that I was doing so that all tied in and showed a genuine interest in research and why I want to go to Hopkins but in addition to that a huge part is having leadership and being involved in your community because um, Hopkins is in the Baltimore area and they really want to be integrated with the community and be able to help the community they actually put so much uh, workers and you know, obviously actual land where Hopkins is located. So it's important that you have that sense of community and that understanding that you have to give back to your community. So I did a lot of research um, and I also did a lot of community service and leadership positions in those community service organizations like Key Club. So that's, that's like a, my example. Another example was my friend who is currently studying public health, but she actually applied to Hopkins as a German major. And um, she did, a lot of community service she's from Georgia and she also did poetry in German so after taking German classes for a couple of years mm -hmm. in high school she just entered in some poetry competitions and there was something that she was passionate about and then she applied as a German major to Hopkins and then she got admitted changed to public health so that's like another route you can do too so you can see that just from those two examples there's such a wide variety of things that you can do um, uh, and still get admitted. So there's no specific extracurricular activities. I think it just has to be genuine. And ideally, um, they aren't just like random activities that you're doing. Because I see that very often where students want to join every club possible and just because they think it sounds good. So they'll join the school newspaper, they'll join uh, National Honor Society, they'll join like Key Club, they'll join all those clubs. And if they think that it looks good on their application, but it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't tie together cohesively to, to make a story. Um, so the best way to make sure it's cohesive and to, to have a story is not to explicitly think about, oh, what can I do to piece it together to make a story? It's to actually just pursue things that interest you genuinely and, and it'll naturally form together. Yeah, I don't know if Justin has, has more um, insight into, into that. Yeah, um, so I actually wanted to read um, an article that came up from GHU because they released the early decision one, uh, class of 2025 decisions uh, yesterday, actually. Um, so in this paragraph, it says, among the newest class are a developer of an EEG headband prototype for individuals with epilepsy, a prison reform advocate who drafted an expungement bill for attorneys in their home, um, as well as uh, an engineer who built an earthquake resistant desk with a sensor and alarm. So you can kind of see that kind of gives a taste of what kind of applicants Hopkins looks for. Um, it's obviously like very unique. It's not like a typical person who um, it's just applying to college. Um, they look for that curiosity and willing to explore the unknown and build things that are unconventional. Um, so extracurriculars, yes, you can kind of explore what your high school is providing you right now, but I would highly recommend searching outside of your high school as well. Um, so like for me and Anson, we did the same uh, summer research program, which was not affiliated with our high school in any way. And I think that really uh, brought our application to a different standard. Um, I would also say that, uh, like like Anson said, don't try to do so many things at the same time. Instead, focus on what you're really interested in. Um, lots of people that I know made the mistake to just like put a whole bunch of things on a resume. But if you look at the actual times they were in the club, it was only like maybe a year or half a year. And um, honestly, you can't really do that much in the time, um, especially in high school. So I would recommend for some of the younger people out there, um, maybe like freshmen or sophomores that are in high school, um, if they're in the audience, definitely start like uh, ironing out like what your direction is and see if you can join clubs that are all sort of connected together because starting early is never a bad thing. And it can really help you with college applications and anything you wanna do later on. Um, in terms of the second question, um, like Anton said, those statistics are there. Um, I know there's like a bunch of like valedictorians and salutatorians that are uh, my friends that I know of. Um, but at the same time, like 
class rank doesn't really define you because it's just such a large disparity amongst all the different high schools across the US. So there's gonna be class sizes of like 30 students in those like private high schools. And then uh, Anson and my school was like 600 um, per class, I think. So that's like a very wide disparity and um, it can mean different things because there's obviously gonna be uh, different educational experiences within um, more funded, better funded high schools versus inner city schools that don't have the same opportunities as you know, suburban schools may have. So it, it is sort of a consideration, but uh, it shouldn't hinder you from looking into Hopkins as a potential school to apply to. Great, thank you guys so much for answering those questions and giving such detailed responses. Um, we're gonna move on to the next one. And this is just like any kind of additional tips. I mean, you've already both talked a lot about, you know, the college essay process and kind of how you formulated your essays, but if you have any additional tips to consider when writing the essays, whether they're the common app or supplements or um, anything else. Yeah. Um... I don't have too many specific tips, but I, or like specific tips to writing it, but I do have a couple of tips on, on how to guide your writing. So first of all, um, if you go to the Hopkins website, this is helpful for anyone, whether or not you're applying to Hopkins, they actually have a section on the website called, called essays that worked. Um, and it's actually a list of dozens of common app essays that uh, admissions officers specifically picked out because they liked them. And they have the copy of the essay and they also have reviewers uh, review comments from the admissions officer. So they'll be like, Mary wrote about X and Y and we really like this because it demonstrates A and B. And I think that's a really good place to look for, especially for students who have no idea where to start. They don't know how to formulate uh, a common app essay or they're looking for inspiration. There's some really incredible essays there. Um, and the admissions officer picked them because they're so incredible. Like I was reading them and comparing them to, to my common app essay, I was like, whoa, this is like a whole nother level. But it definitely gives you really great inspiration of how to proceed. So I would recommend that first of all. Um, second of all, this is a quote that I heard from like when I was looking uh, into colleges and starting to write my essays. And this is something I really took to heart when I was writing every single essay. And even now when I'm applying to you know, different research programs and internship programs. Um, this is something that guides what I put down on the paper. And they say that if you're walking down the hallway and you drop your common app essay on the floor, someone should be able to pick it up. Someone closer should be able to pick it up and recognize that it's talking about you and it's not talking about anybody else in the entire school, the entire world. Um, so that really just talks to how it should be really, be really unique and a lot of students use anecdotes when they're uh, either opening up their essay or like trying to explain and show a side of themselves. And that's definitely a good route to go. But it's important to consider that all anecdotes are not created equal. And just because you have something that's a personal experience to you doesn't mean that it's unique. Like for example, um, my English teacher used to say, never talk about the three Ds. It's like disease, death, and divorce. <laughs> that's basically what they say because um, a lot of people obviously those three things are a huge part of their lives and definitely uh, could have changed them in many ways and forced them to learn different lessons and if it's something that you think uh, really moves you and you think shows something about you great you can talk about that but a lot of people talk about that and even though it's a personal experience it's not a unique personal experience so I would I would advise you to think about something that doesn't have to be super impactful it doesn't have to be something life-changing it could be people literally write about a day that they go on the beach there's a really famous i think there was a new york times article that came out someone talked about going to costco and uh that was the essay that they wrote about and they got into like a bunch of great universities so be deliberate about what stories you're trying to tell and try try to be unique when you do them Yeah, I think that um, especially for people applying to um, like more STEM schools like Hopkins, um, writing and like English in general is probably the hardest thing they have to do. Um, I know in high school, uh, English was easily my worst subject. Um, but I want to say that it, it takes um, a lot of time and effort and practice to, to really perfect that essay. Um, in science, you learn about how to write technically, right? So you're, you're using a whole bunch of data and um, like adjectives specific to your data to prove some hypothesis right or wrong. Um, 
But in personal essays, you're you're not really doing that. It's something completely different. It's a personal narrative about something that happened in your life um, that had some sort of deeper meaning or um, showed showed um, growth, like Nicole said from before. Um, so I want to say that, like like Anson said, it has to be original. Um, it uh, I I asked like a lot of my uh, family and friends to read my essay. And I feel like my first three drafts just they didn't like because they thought it didn't represent me well. Um, and I definitely took that into consideration and uh, really improved on that. Um, I know um, sometimes you think about your essays a lot, like trying to perfect like every single little typo or oh, where can I take away a word so I can add an extra adjective to maybe make it sound better. But there's also a point where you're adding so many adjectives and descriptive phrases where it just becomes super convoluting and you're losing that overall message of what you want to say. And that is definitely a problem when you overwork an essay. Um, to, I, I have reviewed um, lots of college essays before and I found that there's just like so many descriptive words trying to describe this one story or anecdote that they had. And then it takes up like three quarters of the essay without really uh, wrapping it back up to that deeper meaning. Um, so definitely be mindful of that. I also want to say that um, it's important to have a flow that you can kind of connect the conclusion and the beginning of your story together. Um, if something that you introduced in the beginning has nothing to do with what you learned or grew or that major lesson that you had um, in the end, it doesn't really um, merge well together. And then the admissions officer will be kind of confused of what you were talking about or what you're trying to say about yourself. So just make sure you allocate enough time to write it. And maybe sometimes your best essay will be, you know, writing it at 2 a.m. and then it's like your best essay. Uh, you never really know because that's just how it works. So yeah, that's all the advice I have. Awesome, thank you guys. Yeah, I, again, completely agree with everything they said. Um, the one thing that I kind of want to elaborate on that Justin mentioned was giving yourself time. I think in terms of being able to like dig deep and to find these personal stories and the areas of growth and like finding the connection between the points that you're making by starting early, whether it's August or September, depending on when you apply, um, you give yourself the time to do those rewrites and to be able to like, okay, if you have one draft, you maybe love it, maybe don't, don't go deep enough. You can, you know, have enough, you have, a, you have time to keep going and to um, dig, keep digging deeper, which I think was really helpful, at least for me. I think I went through maybe 10, 15 drafts um, in the first couple of months. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, took me quite a while to figure out. I ended up writing my essay um, about an AP physics class that I took my junior year of high school that I did not do so well in. And I compared, I talked about this idea of temporary setbacks and how it's not just a failure, it's a temporary setback. Um, and I compared my experience in this AP physics class to my house flooding um, a week before you're we supposed to move back into it after doing a year of construction. Um, and so while these, you know, were, could be like typical events that happen in people's lives separately, they happened to me within a span of like two or three weeks. Um, and I use this like quote that my dad has told me since I was a kid that it's not a failure, it's a temporary setback. And it came from a random um, football coach at Fresno State that he happened to know. Um, and so with that, and with these anecdotes, I really tried to make it personal, but I did this over a period of like three and a half months, um, which I think is was probably the most beneficial aspect for me. The other thing I would say is making it, I think Justin talked about this a little bit, making it as easy to follow as possible for the admissions officer. You don't wanna have things all over the place and have it be like a jumbled roadmap, um, start to finish, beginning to end, making it as clear cut and simple um, as possible in just terms of like a logical flow, I think is the best way to go about it. Um, there were a couple questions that have been asked in the Q and A. Um, one of which is how you guys chose your major at uh, JHU, if you guys want to elaborate um, on that. Sure. Um, so Hopkins is very flexible in, in the majors that you can choose, but there are only two majors. Yeah, two majors that you can only get into uh, the first time that you apply. So you can't switch into them. And the first one is music at the Peabody Conservatory. So that's still in Baltimore. It's like a small bus right away. So if you want to study voice, piano, any type of instrument that you can't just transfer into that because obviously you need to have some sort of 
actually a very high level of musical skill before you're able to be admitted in, into that program. And the other one is the biomedical engineering program um, at the Wyoming School of Engineering. Um, so there are a couple reasons that I decided to choose to study BME at Hopkins. So one of them is that Hopkins is the founding place for, for the undergraduate and graduate study of biomedical engineering. And it's like ranked number one in, in the world. And it's also very diverse in the different aspects of biomedical engineering that you can study. So if you go on the website, I think it's like bme.jhu.edu, you can see um, how your program is separated into a couple of different focus areas. So like I said in my introduction, mine is in cell and tissue engineering but there are people who do it in neuroengineering, in images and imaging and medical devices like Justin, immunoengineering, in uh, computational medicine, uh, data. There's like a bunch of different focus areas. And because biomedical engineering is such a multidisciplinary and gigantic field with so many applications in different spaces um, that it really has a, a spot for everyone. And I know so many students, myself included, who applied to different majors at other schools. So I applied obviously to a bunch of other schools. I applied as I applied as a public health major. I applied as a biochemistry major. I applied as a sociology major. Uh, I applied for race and ethnicity studies. And those are like a bunch of, this is something that's like not uncommon. I've heard of a lot of students who applied like English, not even STEM or applied like chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, but all of them eventually chose to study biomedical engineering at Hopkins is because so many of the disciplines STEM are not converged together. And something that's less obvious is that social sciences aspect. So like if you're interested in economics, if you're interested in sociology, how does that tie into biomedical engineering? And I think, um, one of them is that the first class that you take at Hopkins for BME is a class called Biomedical Engineering and Design. And there you actually talk about health inequity and how as engineers, we have an ethical code and a moral compass that we have to follow. And how can we use a science and technology to not just create um, $500,000 monoclonal antibody treatments that only the like top 1% can have access to. How can you create things that are accessible for everyone, right? And then the other thing is our design team program, which um, is one of the most unique in the entire country, I think, and where groups of undergraduate students work with physicians at Johns Hopkins Hospital and other uh, institutions across the US, and they actually develop their own medical devices. And obviously part of that is a science aspect right how do you prototype how do you engineer how do you build a device and the other part is like the entrepreneurship uh looking into your market who are you trying to help and that's like a really really great opportunity and something that i definitely want to pursue and one of the major reasons why i decided to choose hopkins is how all those things converge together and hopkins has like is really successful in that particularly for undergraduates and um it, particularly for the design team program, uh, students win hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a year from their um, competitions that they go to through, through the design team program. And a number of them each year actually end up becoming startups. And there's a group right now called Relavo and they develop, develop this new um, dialysis device. And there are these three women who are like literally 21, 22, 23, and they're all finishing undergrad and they're going to work on their company together which is super amazing because they're like my classmates and they're like winning these grants from the NIH which are meant for professors who have spent 30 years in academia but they're winning them as like 20 something year olds which uh, hearing those stories and being inspired by them really really pulled me to study about medical engineering. Yeah um, for me um, I similarly uh, this was the only school I actually applied engineering to um, all my other schools were, I think, mostly cognitive neuroscience um, and like general biology, because um, um, during that time I was still like considering medicine as a career later on. Um, now I'm not pre med anymore, but um, BME was um, what I thought was the best fit for uh, my application to Hopkins specifically. Um, it was really easy on the Common App application because. I think all I had to do was like click a checkbox and then you would automatically like apply to the program and you would get it on the same day as your RD or ED um, decision. So um, it wasn't like time consuming to write because there wasn't like an extra supplement or essay or things you need to submit. Um, but B 
BME, the BME major in particular, it is a selective process unlike other majors out there. Um, and they do hold you at a higher standard. Um, so um, Anson, I forgot what the acceptance rates for BME in particular was. Um, yeah, they don't, they don't release it publicly, but the way that it works is um, you first go through the regular admissions office. So you have to first be admitted into the university. And then the students who are admitted to the university are then passed off to the BME admissions committee. Um, where approximately a third of the students will get in. So you can do the math. It's, it's usually like low single digits for people who apply to BME because BME is, I think, one of the most popular majors that are applied to. Um, so it, it's like a two-step process and that's how it works. But they don't go into too much detail about like acceptance rate and everything, but it, it is very, a very competitive process, yeah. But yeah. there's not any additional work. So if you're interested in BME, I highly recommend like you just select as your first choice major and then you're in, in consideration for that process uh, for, for a BME major. And before I just like hand it back over to Justin, I just want to say that if you even have like a little bit of interest in BME, I highly recommend putting it as your first choice because it can't hurt you. Um, but if you decide you want to go into BME after you matriculate, there's no chance of that. They don't allow any transfers into the program. But you can always transfer out. So um, if you want to see what it's like for us, I, I would recommend putting it. Yeah, yeah um, definitely something else is that um, if you're planning on applying early decision to Hopkins and you put down BME as your uh, initial major, but you don't get into BME, um, then you're not bounded to go to Hopkins. Um, so that's kind of like a special thing that Hopkins has. Um, so that might incentivize you to apply early um, if you want to do that. Um, I, um, so this was like maybe spring of freshman year, I was definitely considering um, transferring out of BME just because um, engineering, everything was very new to me. I was taking like a whole bunch of like high level math and DFEQ and linear algebra and like physics too. And those are all like very new concepts to me that I found very challenging. Um, but looking back at it now, um, like a few months later, I'm glad I didn't make that decision and decide to stick with it um, because BME is, I'm not gonna lie, it, it is a tough major, but at the same time, there are so many more opportunities you can get as a BME student compared to other majors. Um, honestly, it's like kind of unfair, like the amount of like extra advising, extra opportunities, extra funding that we get. Um, but I think that's what makes it such a great program because you know design team and the focus areas like Anson talked about, um, it's something you can't really get anywhere else. and. Yeah, so that's kind of why I chose being me. All right, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, there was another question that came up in the chat about how important it is to take AP and or some kind of college level classes while still in high school. Um, I don't know if it was specifically directed at the BME program or just for Johns Hopkins in general, but if you guys wanna talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I would say if you have AP or IB programs, definitely take it. Um, obviously, it will help show that you're taking a rigorous course load to, to admissions officers. But beyond that, once you matriculate, undoubtedly taking those AP classes will be so, 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 so helpful. Um, I like, in my opinion, honestly, those intro classes are harder <laughs> and more time consuming than a lot of like the upper level biomedical engineering classes I'm taking right now. Um, the P sets are just like the problem sets are just painful. The classes, there are so many introductory classes that you have to take. So I think like for most engineering programs and also if you're pre-med, um, you're going to have to take physics one, physics two, and their associated labs. You're going to have to take chemistry one, chemistry two, and their associated labs. You're going to take calculus one and calculus two. You're going to take um, uh, biology if you're doing biology one and biology two. That's a lot of different classes that you could knock off, uh, you know, your checklist if you have them for, for your AP already. And that gives you a lot more room to spread out your classes, take classes that you want um, throughout your undergraduate career. And that's definitely what I did. So all the AP credit I got from high school. So I had chemistry, I had calculus, and I had biology, and I had some statistics. So I took all that credit so I could actually ease up and take organic chemistry my freshman year instead of taking it sophomore year. Um, I was able to take like some cool biomedical engineering intro classes that sounded interesting to me. So definitely take those AP classes and so you don't have to take them at Hopkins because they're, in my opinion, and I think many people agree with this, it's not a very pleasant experience to take those introductory classes at first. So 
um, avoid them at all costs. Yeah. Yeah, um, echoing everything he said, uh, definitely take as many AP tests as your finances allow. And if you even feel like you're like mediocre at a subject, just take it anyways. And um, maybe there's a chance you'll get a four or five and that will give you credit in some areas. Um, and in the long run, like if you do want to graduate a semester early, you're saving um, like $28,000. So that is a pretty good balance. Uh, very true. <laughs> awesome. Um, another question that was asked um, was just about dual enrollment. If JHU was any um, preference regarding dual enrollment in high school programs, um, and do they prefer students who like are, already have this college credit, or does everyone kind of come in on, you know, an even playing field? Mm, yeah. So dual enrollment is accepted on a case by case basis. I'd say a vast majority of the time, um, if you're dual enrolling in very common courses that are not AP courses, um, they'll accept them. So I guess the most common ones would be linear algebra, differential equations. If you took those at a local community college through, through dual enrollment or local university, uh, generally, if you've got a grade from them through the, through the college, it'll, it'll generally transfer over. And that's a really great idea as well to test out of more, more classes. Oh, also calculus three as well, if you dual enroll that. So mostly the math courses. Um, in terms of an even playing field, this is something that's like a huge controversy now, and I like personally agree with it, is that the fact of the matter is you're not coming into college on an even playing field. Justin alluded to that before, where you're coming from schools who are like, you know, private college preparatory schools where people sometimes take AP biology in like ninth grade or eighth grade even, and they are like taking these really intense coursework, held to a really high standard, learning those skills, versus some schools that um, you know, don't even offer AP or IB programming. And uh, a lot of times you're coming into your first semester and you're taking those same courses and it's a very, very uneven playing field. And you can see that quantitatively. Like if you look at the distributions of scores in the first semester, you're going to have massive standard deviations, like 16, 17, 18 point standard deviations versus when you go into sophomore year where the learning curve significantly is like basically closed up more because people have had that experience and your standard deviations become more normal. So like eight, nine, 10. And I, don't, I personally don't know what the solution to that is, but it is something that's really something that you see. And I think it's very unfair, but people don't, don't come in at a you know, even playing field, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have those opportunities to take those upper level classes, take them. Yeah. That's the basic moral. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely take as challenging of the classes that your high school offers as possible. Um, that gives you um, at least a decent exposure of what college courses are like. Um, I think like um, my most challenging classes in high school were AP Chemistry and AP Calc BC, which I both thought were um, difficult because I was spending like many hours of homework a week and um, the content was like a little bit more different than some of my other classes like AP Econ or like AP Bio. Um, but yeah, you, you don't come in with a level playing field. Um, there's always gonna be people that are smarter than you. Um, imposter syndrome is definitely a real thing, but um, you have to realize that you um, play to your own strengths, right? And the amount of effort that you put into a class, um, if you feel like, um, so there's, there's definitely going to be classes that you're stronger at and, and classes that you're weaker at. Um, so like for me, um, I'm better at bio, but we're set, you know, physics two, for instance. So I put more time and effort into studying physics two and all the concepts and calculations. Um, and then I didn't have to spend as much time in bio like other people who were the opposite of me, right? So um, don't ever disregard the strengths that you have and um, be proud that you already got accepted into whatever school you're going to and just work hard from there. And uh, through those intro classes, I do think they're beneficial in helping you decide, is that major really right for you? Um, or do you want to study something different? So take as diverse of a class as your major allows. Um, I think that's a beneficial thing about uh, many gen ed schools, which allow you to take like writing and science and math and all those different genres of, of subjects. So just explore and um, eventually you will succeed. 
Awesome. Yeah. Again, I completely agree with everything you guys said. Um, there was one question that came up that I did want to mention before we ended and before I asked you guys to give like one last piece of advice. Um, but there was, it was about uh, SAT subject tests and if they were um, important, you know, and how I guess they affected um, BME and Hopkins in general in the application process. What are your guys' opinions on those? Um, I'd say go ahead and take the SAT subject test, but unlike schools like, you know, like Caltech or MIT, I don't think Hopkins puts a very heavy emphasis on SAT subject tests. I personally only submitted one SAT subject test and it was an SAT subject test I took in ninth grade for, you know, the biology one. So I took that and I was like, okay, I did okay on it. So I'm going to submit it. But then I didn't feel like paying extra money to like, you know, submit the rest. So I just didn't do it. And, you know, I still got in. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's something that's heavily weighted. Um, if you have them already, if you took them already, obviously go ahead and send them in. But I, if you haven't taken them and you're like feeling a lot of pressure to study, you don't have enough time, I would say uh, prioritize other things. Yeah, yeah um, I don't think it's like a very heavy emphasis either. Um, I did submit, I think two or three of my SAT subjects because I scored like between uh, 750 and 800 on all of them. I think that was bio, chem, and like world history for some reason, um, which had nothing to do with my major, but it was free. Like as long as you submit your SAT, you can attach as many subject tests you want to with that submission. So it's not like extra cost or anything. So it's kind of up to your own discretion and um, if you think it will benefit your application. Awesome. Um, and then if you guys just have one last piece of advice to leave students with, just whether it's about um, BME or Johns Hopkins or the application process and essay writing process in general. Uh, I think, I guess the, the one tip that I would give, and this is something that Justin slightly mentioned before, is especially if you're a younger student who's watching this webinar right now, is to not think about college applications as a discrete process. So it's not something that just occurs between August to December of your senior year, right? This is not just like those couple months where you're writing your essays. College applications is a culmination of your entire 16, 17, 18 years um, that you've been learning and growing as an individual. And a way to materialize that is that, especially if you're a sophomore or freshman right now, whenever you come up with an idea, this is something that I did is actually keep a note stock on your phone. If you come up with an idea that you're just like, oh wow, this is pretty interesting. Um, this is something I might wanna talk about. This might be something that I want to share with the admissions officer, just jot it down because you're not gonna remember it. But if you have a note stock and say that time period of college application does come by, um, you'll have a list of a bunch of really idea, good ideas, whether or not they're good or bad at that point when you're reading them, you have those ideas as a good jumping point. And that's a really good way to think about where your experiences are a culmination um, of, of everything. It's not just, that time period where you're a senior, you're like, oh, shit, I have to apply to um, college. I better start thinking of who I am, better start thinking about uh, what story I have to tell. It's it's everything. So, Yeah, um, definitely agree with everything Ensign said. Um, I would say the first thing is try to visit as many campuses as you can. Um, obviously, it's um, it takes like a lot of time to like plan different vacations, especially if the campuses are further away. Um, but the campus vibe and like feeling just like the atmosphere of walking through campus, the roads, the buildings, um, the city around it, or the suburbs maybe, um, what does that feel like? Does it feel like home to you? Um, and you kind of create that like, uh, so I created an Excel spreadsheet of just like all the colleges I visited. And then I typed in notes that I was feeling um, like, the day of after I visit the college. Um, and then like, I think the people um, and like the opportunities specific to that college are super important in considering what colleges you do want to apply to. Um, like, so for me, for Hopkins, um, Baltimore um, definitely wasn't my like first choice place I wanted to go to. But the moment I entered that like Hopkins campus, I knew um, I could call it home for the next four years. It's just a beautiful little um, bubble, you can call it of um, like 18th, 19th century buildings. Um, there's like marble, there's brick. It's a really nice aesthetic. 
and like the college town around it is like super great and I could see myself in there. Um, so yeah, definitely visit as much as you can. And if you can't, especially during COVID, do virtual tours. Uh, I think most universities will do that now. Um, my second piece of advice would be uh, to not be afraid of asking for help. Um, I know for me, I am a very independent thinker. I like to do things by myself because I think that's just like the best way to get things done efficiently. Um, but college apps was a very uh, different story for me. And that's why I found it challenging, I think. Um, because I would often like go very hard and set high expectations for myself of this is where I want to see this essay going, um, but it's not really what, where I want to uh, go at the moment. And I'm not, I don't know how to like get it to that place I want it to be. So um, my guidance counselor, actually, she was a fantastic help, um, gave really constructive feedback um, and in my family and friends as well, like I mentioned. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely give your essay to say, I would at least say um, maybe like four or five people um, and just ask uh, one, like, does this really represent who you are? Like from reading this, can you tell that it's me? And two, just check for like logistics, grammar uh, errors. And that's kind of how uh, you can find like that perfect essay um, that will best represent you. Great, thank you guys so much for sharing all your insight and every all your information about your experiences and as well as both at Johns Hopkins and with the college essay process in general. Um, Thazen, is there anything else you wanted to mention before we log off? That's it, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you uh, to you also, Nicole, for leaving this webinar. Of course, happy yes. to help. Yeah, thank you all, all right. so much, Justin, Anson, and Nicole, yeah. Have a great rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye. All right. Well, good evening to you all and good night. Bye.